Good afternoon. I want to express thanks to the organizers of the conference, to the staff of the museum. I am very happy to take part in this event, and now I am going to read my presentation in English. In 1987, the Moscow-based publishing house for architecture and construction, Stroy's Dutt, re released the monumental volume Architecture of the USSR, 1917 to 1987. Published on the 70th anniversary of the October Revolution, this book was intended to be an authoritative and comprehensive account of building production in the Soviet Union. Now, many of us are familiar with this book. It's perhaps the most lavish volume on the history of Soviet architecture to date. It's more than 500 pages are filled with images of buildings of all types from each of the Soviet republics. Although the book appears primarily to be an album, its authors subjected each phase in the development of Soviet architecture to historical scrutiny. But if the development of mass housing is put aside, the historical narrative, for the most part, develops as a story of singular monuments and exemplary authors. The final section, covering the period 1971 to 87, is exemplary in this regard. The buildings described here range from the House of the Soviets in Kaluga to Brezhnev Square in Almaty and Leonid Pavlov's automotive service buildings from Moscow. The treatment of the Lenin Palace of the Friendship of Nations in Tashkent is symptomatic of the approach to architecture in this volume. Color photographs of the building take up a two-page spread showing the interior and various facade details. Its dates of construction, 1975 to 1981, and its designers are listed, Yevgeny Rosinov and Vsevolod Shostopolov and others. The text, describes, uh, this text that describes the building, written, I believe, largely by Alexander Rabushin, attributes authorship to a single figure. The new work of Yevgeny Rosinov, the, the description reads, is a purely artistic, free interpretation of ancient and exceptionally contemporary motifs. The building, surely among one of the most interesting projects of the late Soviet era, is presented as a singular monument by a master architect. Another book of 1987, also published by Stroizdat, offers a different picture of the Lenin Palace of, of the Friendship of Nations in Tashkent. This volume, Architecture, the Work of Moscow's Design and Scientific Institutes, 1979 to 83, was one of a series of publications that collected important work from the capital's design organizations. Here, the palace in Tashkent appears in the chapter devoted to the Boris Mezentsev Central Scientific Research and Design Institute for the typical and experimental design of cultural, athletic, and administrative buildings, better known as Snyep Mezentseva, or the Mezentsev Institute. Here, the palace in Tashkent is presented as one of many unique projects undertaken by the institute, which range from the seat of the Communist Party in Yaroslavl to uh, the branch of the Central Museum of Lenin in Samara. But this volume also indicates that the spectrum of architectural production of the Mezentsev Institute was broader still. The palace is juxtaposed directly with a typified project for a sports hall intended for areas in, with permafrost regions, or for permafrost regions in the north. In other words, the typical sports hall and the singular palace are presented as two aspects of the production of one institution. Moreover, the work of the Mezentsev Institute is set in the context of numerous other institutes. By my, account, by my count, 47 institutes appear on the cover of this volume. This book thus emphasizes the institutional infrastructure of design and recognizes the relationship between the typical and the singular in Soviet architectural production. But why devote so much time to the details of the presentation of a single building in these books from 1987? I'd like to suggest that the gap between the discussion of the palace in Tashkent as a singular monument by a master architect and the discussion of the building as a product of a bureaucratic design apparatus corresponds to a larger, unresolved problem for the analysis of late Soviet architecture. This problem might be summarized as follows. To tell the story of late Soviet architecture as a succession of singular monuments is to neglect the complementary relationship between the typical and the singular in Soviet architectural production. This relationship was understood, understood and discussed in the Soviet era, but the importance of the categories of the typical, typovoye, and the singular, unikalneye, or individualneye, has not yet been recognized. To direct our attention to this relationship requires us to examine how buildings manifested and refined typical solutions. We ha will have to consider how design institutes described the, distributed the authorship of architects as building production became embedded in, 
networks of production and regulation of increasing complexity. When we examine the history of Soviet architecture from the mid-1950s onwards from this point of view, we see that a dynamic and contested relationship between the typical project and the singular object motiv motivated much of Soviet architectural work, work that has to date largely been neglected in historical accounts. Moreover, when we focus our attention on the dialectical relationship between the typical and the singular, we gain a clearer understanding of the specificity of Soviet architecture. From this point of view, or for this point of view, invites us to consider the late Soviet design apparatus not as a barrier to creativity, as it is usually interpreted, but rather as an architectural system that excelled in the production of norms. I cannot address all of these questions during this short presentation, but I'd like to dis discuss some consequences of this approach to late Soviet architecture with particular, oh, wrong way, here we go, with particular attention to Boris Miezensev and the design institute he would come to direct. In what follows, I'll sketch an architectural and institutional history of both how typical and singular projects were complementary aspects of the late Soviet built environment and how these categories were synthesized, how the singular came to bear the typical within itself, and how the dynamic between these modes of design produced new, uniquely Soviet architectural norms. Now, Boris Miezensev is remembered primarily for the Lenin Memorial Complex in Ulyanovsk which was designed and constructed between 1967 and 1970, as we've already seen. This was certainly one of the most prestigious projects of the early Brezhnev era. Responsibility for the design uh, of the project lay with the Central Scientific Research Institute for the Experimental Design of Cultural, Athletic, and Administrative Buildings that Miezensev had directed since its foundation in 1964. Now, the building's form would be unthinkable without reference to Le Corbusier's work, and it became the heart of a large-scale reconstruction of the city center undertaken by a number of design institutes from Soviet Russia. This building played an important role in a process I would call the normalization of the public ceremonial building, and I'll return to this project shortly. For the moment, it's useful to, it's useful to look briefly at Mezensev's earlier work, as it would appear that he was particularly sensitive to the typical qualities of Soviet architectural design. Miezensev's first large-scale works are connected with the reconstruction effort following World War II. In the immediate post-war period, he worked primarily on the design of train stations damaged during the war. His work in this area remained firmly within the typological framework used by other arch architects. Kharkov Southern Train Station, for example, has a monumental symmetry. Colossal columns form a broad central portico, above which the clerestory of the interior vault is visible. Towers articulated by pilasters flank the central space, lending the building a varied silhouette. Miezensev's project for the train station in Sm Smolensk bears striking similarities to the building in Kharkov. Here, a columnar screen occupies the central bays of both lateral and longitudinal facades. Again, clear story windows to the main hall are visible above the screens, and here the tower motif is repeated, though in a less pronounced manner. The Kharkov and Smolensk train stations share key elements which receive greater or lesser emphasis in each respective project. It's worth adding one more building to this discussion, the main train station in Dnipropetrovsk by Alexei Dushkin and I am Petrubach. Here again, the elements of the train station type are present, columnar screens, clerestory windows, and flanking towers. While there are certainly differences among these projects, they, are never, they nevertheless share a wide range of features features that cannot be simply reduced to the functions of the buildings this, of, that the buildings serve. Instead, what seems most interesting about these buildings to me is not their differences or singularities, but rather the way they conform to a normalized set of features, approximating a typical approach to design. Miezensev's awareness of norms is readily apparent in, the approach, in his approach to funerary architecture. His mausoleum for the Mongolian revolutionary hero, Damdin Sukhbatar, completed in 1952, makes this readily apparent. Situated in the heart of Ulaanbaatar, where Miezensev and his institute will build a number of projects in subsequent years, the mausoleum has a severe, compact mass and is crowned by a temple-like structure with a stepped pyramidal roof. Entered through a central portal, the structure also serves as a tribune overlooking a broad square. Now, the precedent for this building is obvious, and Miezensev's debt to Shusev's design for the Lenin mausoleum extends even to the palette of materials selected for Sukhbatar's tomb. Significantly, this was not Miezensev's only engagement with the mausoleum type. One final project designed under, his supervision, uh, under the supervision of his institute for the mausoleum of Ho Chi Minh completed in, was completed in 1970. 
In these mausoleums, as in the example of the train stations, we sense how typical design features render these monuments legible as a distinct group of buildings, while at the same time supporting the singularity of each structure. Now, this quality of typicality is also present in the high-rise designed by Dushkin and Mezentsev at Krasnya Vorota here in Moscow. While each of the seven buildings that were ultimately constructed was completed according to a unique design, the basic similarities among these buildings can't be denied. At a fundamental level, they are all symmetrical high-rises whose masses generally conform to a pyramidal composition. Now, as is well known, these features ultimately derive from the design of the Palace of the Soviets, the absent center of the ensemble of Moscow's high-rises. Now, understood in this way, we can see that while the Palace of the Soviets was never completed, its effects were manifold and far-reaching. And one of the key ways that it had an impact on Soviet architectural culture was in the production of norms relating to everything from the relationship between architecture and the city to the synthesis of advanced technology and historical pre precedents. It was both the most unique building within the Soviet architectural field and the model for typical high-rises, both realized and unrealized in Moscow and other cities in the Soviet Union and beyond. Now, significantly, the Palace of the Soviets maintained this position in the period that is our primary concern here, the post-Stalin era. Now, as Anna has just described, and as Olga Kazakova and others have shown, when the central site for the palace was ultimately abandoned, a multi-stage competition for the new version of the palace was held for a site on Lenin Hills, southwest of Moscow State University between 1957 and 59. The projects submitted to these competitions offer a glimpse of the range of architectural positions available in Moscow at the onset of the thaw. While some entries appeal to the architectural language of the first version of the palace, most were emphatically horizontal in contrast to the nearby university. While it's now recognized that the projects by Alexander Vlasov and his team were favorites in the contest, it is important to note that there was not a clear winner to any stage of the competition. Instead, a range of second prizes, third prizes, and so-called consolation prizes were awarded. Now, we could interpret these results as an indication that the jury was simply not satisfied with any competition results. Such an interpretation, however, would obscure the normative function of the competition. One way to understand this event, and indeed the series of competitions for the first palace of the Soviets, is to see it as an exercise in the production of norms, of the most typical and fundamental features of a new approach to the large administrative buildings. In other words, architectural research on a singular object had general consequences for an entire class of buildings. In this sense, we might consider the Kremlin Palace of Congresses, which we've already seen today, um, which was initiated during the competition for the Palace of the Soviets as one of the most tangible outcomes of the competition. The less tangible, though perhaps more consequential outcome of the competition was the establishment of the administration for the design of the Palace of the Soviets in 1960, with Alexander Vlasov, Yosef Loveko, Boris Miezentsev, and Mikhail Pasokhin as directors. While Pasokhin was largely occupied with the Palace of, the Congress, Congresses, Palace of Congresses in the Kremlin, the rest of his team continued to develop the design of the Palace of the Soviets at the south, southwest site. And here again, I'm relying on Olga Kazakova's work. Vlasov occupied the leading post in the administration until his death in 1962, at which point Miezentsev became director of the administration. The following year, the reorganization of, design, of the design institutes by the State Committee for Civil Construction and Architecture within Gostroy produced the new research institute that Miezentsev would direct until his death in 1970, the Institute for Theater and Sports Buildings. Among the staff of this institute were Yevgeny Rosinov, Mark Bubnov, Sevolod Shostopolov, and others. Now, the work of this institute involved the design of typified projects and unique buildings. Here, it's useful to, to distinguish between formal typification and the production of norms. Because the institute was charged with the creation of types that could be applied to contexts around the Soviet Union, it follows that its, its designers would understand the typical as an important element of design so it would be a mistake to disregard the local adjustments to type projects that make them appear unique. We can see this in the subtle differences between a type project such as number 264.13.3 for a 1,200-seat cinema. This project was realized in cities including Volgograd, Perm, Chelyabinsk, Nizhny Tagil, and others. The version of this project realized in Tolyati departs from the type uh, in the treatment of the lateral facades, the position of the exter exterior stales, stairs, excuse me, and the use of rich mosaic surfaces. Now, we find analogous variations um, in, in realized projects for circuses designed by the Institute. 
Each of the circuses in Sochi, Krasnodar, and Ashgabat offers a variation on the same principal type of a circus for 2,000 spectators. These types were in turn realized in cities such as Gamel, Stavropol, Dushanbe, Grozny, and Bishkek, and other cities. Many examples of this process could be shown, but it's already evident that the realization of typified designs was accompanied by efforts to make them unique, to balance the typical against the singular. Now this process also worked in the opposite direction, when the singular came to embody typical solutions. This process has less to do with the codification of formal typification than with the production of norms of architectural design. This aspect of the Mesensev Institute's work makes it emblematic, I think, of the normalization of Soviet architecture. We find elements of normalization in some of the most prestigious and allegedly unique buildings of the late Soviet era. The Lenin Memorial in Ulyanovsk is, of course, a crucial part of this story. In its general disposition and relationship to urban space, the Lenin Memorial is a descendant of Vlasov's second round project for the Palace of the Soviets in 1959. Each building emphasizes the horizontal and dematerializes the ground floor in an effort to make the upper levels appear to float. Likewise, they each render the primary internal spaces legible as exterior volumes. But this is where we should begin to draw distinctions. For the main space in the palace was the great meeting hall. The main space in the, in the, main space in the Lenin Memorial is the so-called October, or Lenin Hall. This space, the ceremonial heart of the building, is accessed from the second floor. Its location is marked both by the elevated volume of its roof structure and the relief of Lenin's face on the main facade of the building. This space is differentiated further still through the addition of a broad flight of stairs that visitors must climb to enter it. Inside, they find a statue of Lenin set off against a richly ornamented and textured wall of inlaid stone. The key features of the ceremonial space are visible in section. The tall, narrow hall is illuminated by light filtered through both clear story windows and a complex system of skylights. The section this arrangement produces echoes the overall section of the building in miniature. It appears as an elevated volume that cantilevers outward beyond a dematerialized base. There are, of course, other key spaces in the memorial, such as the Universal Hall, but this ceremonial hall, I think, played the most important role in establishing the norms of the Lenin Museum type. This is apparent when we compare the branch of the Central Museum of Lenin in Tashkent with the Lenin Museum in Ulyanovsk. Completed in 1970, the museum in Tashkent was designed by Yevgeny Rozanov and Sivilo Shostopolov within the Mezensev Institute. The most apparent feature of the building in Tashkent is the innovative use of the Brice Soleil, derived from patterns found in Uzbek architecture and crafts. This strategy played an important role in the discussion of national traditions in Soviet architecture, and it clearly identifies this building as a unique or singular construction. But underlying this formal treatment is a parti that is derived directly from the Ulyanovsk model. Indeed, the basic form of the building, a cantilevered box supported by a dematerialized ground floor, can be understood as a reinterpretation and enlargement of the ceremonial hall at Ulyanovsk. This again is even more apparent in section. In Tashkent, as in Ulyanovsk, the ceremonial center of the building is a tall, top-lit hall with a central statue of Lenin. All exhibition spaces are organized around this core. Now, the basic parti of an elevated central hall for a sculpture of Lenin surrounded by exhibition spaces came to represent, I think, the typical solution to the Lenin Museum in the late Soviet period. Now, this is evident in many of the entries to the competition for the Central Museum of Lenin in Moscow from 1969 to 72. Now, as we would expect, the entries submitted by Miezensev, Rozhnev, and Shostopolov follow this formula very closely but it's certainly significant that other architects working in other institutes adopted the same basic approach. Igor Vinogradsky, for example, adopted the norms established at Tashkent and added a sequence of subterranean uh, um, spaces. Anatoly Polyansky's team of architects also adhered to the norm established in Ulyanovsk. In their project, a horizontal volume encloses an elevated courtyard occupied by a monumental sculpture of Lenin. Now, further examples abound. We find this basic principle in Leonid Pavlov's museum in Gorky Leninsky. And, it's also the, the, and it is also the structure of the Lenin museums in Kiev and Ulaanbaatar. Now, to summarize, when we consider the basic elements of the Museum of Lenin first established in Ulyanovsk, we can see that we're dealing with a norm of union-wide significance. What is more, we can see that this norm was crucial to the design of allegedly unique or individual buildings. In other, words, in other words, the production and observance of architectural norms entailed the subordination of singular buildings to typical solutions.
Now, we might ask what is gained by this reintroduction of the typical and the singular into the analysis of Soviet architecture. What do these categories help us understand? And what relationships do they make visible? On the one hand, these categories bring us much closer to the language and culture of the design institutes that were responsible for an unprecedented wave of urbanization and architectural production in the late Soviet era. On the other hand, these categories, as historical artifacts in their own right, invite us to explore the specificity of a system of architectural production that was oriented toward the production of norms. The system was surely plagued by bureaucratic inefficiency, the often contradictory interests of architects in the building industry, and an at times unpredictable command economy. Nevertheless, the constant renegotiation of the relationship between the typical and the singular and the norms that this process produced add up to a specifically Soviet architectural system that deserves greater historical scrutiny. Now, by way of conclusion, we can return to the dichotomy with which I began between a view of late Soviet landmarks as exemplary works by master architects and a view that situates buildings within their institutional origins. When we interpret a landmark of Soviet architecture such as Rosnov and Shestopolov's Lenin Palace of the Friendships of, Nation, of Nations in light of the dynamic relationship between the typical and the singular, new dimensions of its production come into view. It is an invitation to see that in addition to the innovative formal solutions of the architects, in addition to the building's dialogue with national traditions, and in addition to its significant urbanistic role in the center of Tashkent, that the building is also a normative response to a range of typical solutions. Reflecting on the typical and the singular in this building might provide an opportunity to explore its relationship to other palaces, the Palace of the Soviets and the Palace of Congresses among them. Such an interpretation might allow us to see just how the specific relations of architectural production in the late Soviet period could be embedded within the very spatial structure of its most singular monuments. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for this uh, great presentation. I just had a quick, um, perhaps maybe unfair, open-ended question, which is to what extent is this specifically Soviet and to what extent is it specifically socialist? That is a pretty big and open question. Yeah, um, because the, I think the question points to the, the larger issue of typology and how we understand typologies as, a, as an architectural problem. Um, on the one hand, I think, the, the way that it's specifically Soviet is the, is the high degree of centralization that we see here, um, and the kind of the testing of the typological solutions from a very centralized design system. Um, what, how it's particularly socialist, I think, is, a, is an even tougher question. But I'd say that you know it's specifically socialist because this is what socialist architecture was um, at that point. <laughs>